Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Random. McBerto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today. Today we have a whole lot to cover as well. We have a whole lot to cover. You know, folks, uh, the election is coming on and there's a whole lot that we have to do. The first thing that we have to do is work on the minds of people. And what do I mean by work on the minds of people? We have to be able to tell the narrative. We have to secure the narrative. Right now, many people are looking at the polls and as they see the polls, they're constantly saying, ah, we've got that. We've got this. And you know what? I'm actually saying we've got this. But I'm saying we've got this with a caveat. And I want everybody to understand that. We have got this with a caveat. And that caveat being that we are going to go out there and do what is necessary. We are going to go out there and do what we must do to actually win this damn Thing. That is the only way we're going to do it. And w- the, the problem that I have is there are too many right now that sees this and they just think, ah, yeah, we have this one. We are going to win this. There's no, there, there's no doubt about it. There is no doubt that if we keep on the current trajectory, we will win it. But how do you change a the trajectory? There are two ways to change a trajectory, right? Donald Trump can change a trajectory by creating a false narrative. And let me go ahead and show you exactly what I mean. Before we get into the program, I want you to take a look at this. I want you to please look at this in detail and understand what is occurring here. Check this out. It is clear that Peter Navarro, a Trump Spox, or he's actually the White House trade uh, minister or some one of those types of titles, it's clear that what he wanted to do is come on to MSNBC and test out a uh, conspiracy theory that's well that is well apt on Fox News already. He wants to do that here at on MSNBC. See how it would go over. I mean, I think he chose the wrong person to work on that because you know Ali Velshi is pretty. It's a real journalist that's not going to play the he said she said or on one hand this and the other hand this. Check how Ali Velshi handled this theory that somehow China seeded this virus in the United States, and that's why we're having it so bad. He hit him perfectly. Ali, I was watching the show a little earlier, and I saw those scenes of, of the ghost towns on the beaches in my, in my home state of California. It just breaks my heart yep. to see that. And what breaks my heart also is what you talked about, which is the, 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 the partisan nature now of the debate over this whole pandemic. And what we have is, is, is Americans angry about being locked down, anxious about their economic future, and fearful of getting the virus in. And we are a house divided now with Democrats blaming Republicans, Republicans blaming Democrats. I want everybody right here today as, uh, the day before America's Independence Day to understand where this virus started it was the Chinese Communist Party that is making us stay locked in our homes and lose our jobs. They spawned the virus. They hid the virus. They sent hundreds of thousands of Chinese nationals over here to seed and spread the so, virus before we knew. And, 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 Peter, and my point is simply what are the, that... Who are the hundreds of thousands of Chinese nationals? What are you talking about? So... Uh, uh, the, the date line is November, they spawned the virus, probably came out of the biological lab. For two months, they hid the virus from the world and the possibility of a pandemic behind the shield of the World Health Organization. While they did that, they vacuumed up the world's protective equipment, including two billion masks. And uh, So you're saying this is deliberate? Yeah, you're, you're saying the Chinese deliberately did this? Here's the point. While they were preventing any domestic travel from Wuhan to Beijing or Shanghai, locking down their transportation network, they freely sent hundreds of thousands of Chinese nationals on aircraft to go around the world, and that the so, effective. But are you saying the they deliberately did this? Is that what you're saying, Peter? It, it's unclear. I mean, nobody's going to accuse is. you of being a fan of China, but sure. do you believe they did this deliberately? They 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 spawned a virus. You're using the term "spawned a virus." Do you mean There's they no deliberately created they a virus and virus then deliberately in, set up the conditions? China. Uh, here's let me be really clear about this I don't think it matters whether they did what they deliberately did Ali and this is this is beyond reproach in terms of a fact they deliberately allowed Chinese nationals to come to the United States Italy and everywhere in between 
who were infected while they were locking down their own transportation network. And I think it's really important for Americans to understand that. We are angry at each other What now. do you mean deliberately, Peter? I just want to understand deliberately that, that you think they sent people who they knew were infected to Italy and the United States and other places. You, you mentioned hundreds of thousands. Do you believe that actually what, happened? What Someone they intentionally, in China thought that was a, when a plan to do that. Let, let's be careful and clear with the words. What they did <laughs> during this period of time when they knew there was a pandemic, they didn't allow their people to travel inside of China, but they allowed people in China who were likely infected to go around the world, effectively seeding and spreading. So whether it was done intentionally or not, what was intentional is to protect their country, even as they set, send Chinese so nationals out. Let me ask you this. Understand that. Let me ask you this. Do you disagree with that, Alex? Yeah, let me ask you this, though. Do you disagree with that as a fact? I, 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 I'm going to put that aside for a second. I, I, I'm gonna, I, I don't fact. know what I don't know, but here's, here's okay. what I'm going to ask you. Let's say yeah. that's true, that those yeah. people, those hundreds of thousands that that, that you say went out, went to uh, Italy, they went to the United States, they went, to, they went all over the world. Why is our new death, our new disease count, our new infection count so much higher on a seven day rolling basis than anywhere else in the world? At what point does that become well, our problem to contain that, this virus when every other country has been able to? That, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting question and it goes to the origins of the virus. Now, when the virus came out, one of the other things the Chinese did was not really divulge what the genome sequence actually was so that we could get a handle on that. They, they basically scrubbed all those labs where this might have come out. And it, what this looks like, I mean, everybody thought, and this was a reasonable presumption, that come summer, the heat and humidity would get rid of the virus. It doesn't look that way. This looks more like a weaponized virus, rather intentionally or unintentionally, but this is a virus which So is that the reason why, I, I, again, Peter, Peter, you look at other places in the world. You look at Canada, you look at Australia, you look at New Zealand, you look at South Korea, you yeah, look at I mean, Italy, you look at I the think, United Kingdom. Nobody's uh, experiencing this the way mm, we are, but I we think, also don't have any I discipline think, in this country and messaging from the White House where you are about masks sure. and about testing. Sure. And that's where he hit him. No other country, no other country is going through what we are. And the one thing that we know is that the discipline coming from, from the White House is very, very bad. Now, here's the interesting thing. He wants to say, oh, and China also went and bought up all the supplies of masks and PPEs. No, 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 no. Actually, the masks and PPEs were generally <coughs> manufactured in China. How do you gobble up something where you actually do most of the manufacturing? We didn't have the sense enough to make sure that we had a stockpile sufficiently available or manufacturing it here. Likewise, even if that were the case, isn't it true that we have bought up the entire world supply of remdesivir? Think about it. The ineptitude of this government is causing the deaths of a lot of people, and now they want to spin it with some sort of a conspiracy theory. It's nothing about a conspiracy theory. It's, it's a horrendous management by the United States government led by Donald Trump. Now, what we're actually seeing, and the reason I showed that is, remember what I said before, what we're what, what we have this stuff won, but we lose it if we allow the other side to create a false narrative or if we do not present the going forward narrative. And it, it is important that we see that these guys are working on all cylinders by throwing a whole lot of spaghetti on the wall to see what's going to stick. You want to hear another spaghetti? Uh, uh, Brother Biden came out with an op-ed piece in the New York Times that was a powerful hit job. And when I say a powerful hit job on Donald Trump, I mean a powerful hit job on Donald Trump that actually works and it hits him for every single Porsche that they need to put him. So they needed to find something that they could refute in that, in that uh, discussion, right? And so what did they find? Let me play this for you and then we'll take it on the other side. This is astounding. When you see this, you're going to, I don't have any hair in my head to pull. If you have any hair in your head, uh, you're going to pull it. Check this one out. This is just simply astounding. I really had to do a double take on this one. 
These are the kind of messages that we better get out there because a lot of people that are singing glory, glory, hallelujah and following Dr. Trump, believing that Dr. Trump is the person who's going to save America. Dr. Trump is the person who's going to keep those American values after those left-wingers are doing those crazy things to statues and they're trying to demean those great founding fathers of ours who have always been great and believed in the equality of all. Okay. Well, it seems like El Señor Biden wrote a great op-ed piece where he actually talked about all people are created equal and we should live up to those expectations. And that didn't go over well with the GOP. So what did this GOP spokesperson say? I mean, isn't this GOP spokesperson implicitly stating that women are not created as men's equal? Check it out and let's take it on the other side. Ahead of President Trump's salute to America yesterday, Joe Biden releasing a scathing op-ed blasting the president for destroying our democracy. Biden writing, quote, he has made it clear time and again that he won't hesitate to tear apart our most cherished democratic structures for an ounce of personal gain. As president, I will take immediate action to reverse the damage Donald Trump has done to our core democratic rights and institutions. Here to react, RNC national spokesperson Liz Harrington. First and foremost, what's your reaction in general to Biden's words? Well, it's amazing for Joe Biden to talk about eroding our foundation when his party is taking a sledgehammer to it. They're saying you can't go to Mount Rushmore, you can't celebrate Washington, Jefferson and Lincoln. You can't uplift our rich history and celebrate it on our Independence Day. His party is trying to rewrite history, tear it all down, and it's very fitting that Joe Biden in this op-ed has the audacity to literally rewrite the greatest foundational document in the history of mankind, the Declaration of Independence. His woke staffers changed it to not all men are created equal, all people are created equal and are guaranteed equality throughout life. That is not a constitutional republic that we were founded on, on freedom of opportunity. That's the same radical left socialism that has taken over his party that is really not just eroding our foundation, but rewriting it and out to destroy it. Okay, so now women to have the same rights, wanting everybody in a country to have the same rights, equality. That is socialism and that is not giving everyone their rights and that is... I think what, what uh, Biden did was kind of improve on the positivity of the founding fathers because the reality is only uh, white, white uh, men who own property could vote. Uh, later on, it's when everything else changed. Let's also be clear now, the Constitution as being the best foundational document ever created needed amendments to come a little bit closer to making people equal. So let's be clear here that this woman, this GOP spokesperson, this RNC GOP spokesperson would come out and tell Americans that because Brother Biden says all people are created equal, that is some socialist left-wing idea, it probably tells you where they are. Now, I, I, I had to do a double take there. Actually, I was listening to Tom Hartman, and Tom Hartman alluded to it, and I said, you know what? I had to leave immediately, and then I said, you know what? Let me go find this stuff that I heard talk, Tom Hartman talk about. Then I found the video, and it's like, are you serious? Again, uh, Vice President Biden says, uh, people created equal, and you know we want to live up to that, ex to, to that expectation. And she, she got pissed. Oh, you're trying to change this constitution. The constitution said all men are created equal. Not all people are created equal. And this is a woman saying this. Um, but again, remember as I stated before, we have to be careful with narrative because these are things that they're trying to put into the heads of people. They try to normalize a whole lot. What they're really trying to do is normalize much. And the way we have to handle this is for each time that they do this, we show how inept it is, how silly it is. And notice that she didn't say in her narrative uh, that women are not created equal. She simply accused Biden of saying people created equal 
when the Constitution said men. Biden said people to make sure he was all inclusive. She took offense to that. If she took offense to that, what it really means is she's implicitly saying women are not created equal. And what we as progressives, I think it is our duty to do is to go ahead and expand on the other layers. So the title that I'm given that particular blog when I write it for this particular clip is going to be simple. I mean, I'm not going to pull any punches. People are going to say, well, she didn't say that. And I'm going to say, it. no, she, imp she didn't say that. She implicitly said that spokeswoman for, uh, for the GOP implicitly says that women are not created equal. We have to learn to get the narrative just like they do. Did I, is, is that an accurate statement? It is absolutely so because if you are saying all people are not created equal, the Constitution said men are created equal, and you allow the GOP to get away with that narrative so they can expand on that later on, you leave out the portion that says you're then saying women are not created equal, and we as progressives will never, ever stand for that. So we have to learn how to use this better better word mangling than they do. They have an expert that does it for them. And what we need to do is all become the experts in doing it. And we have to be clear cut in the way we do these things. And I, th that is one of the reasons I like Chris Hayes now. Chris Hayes, I think it was on Friday or maybe late Thursday. I don't remember, but I hadn't played this one. Chris Hayes came cry. Let me, let me just play Chris Hayes and then we'll take it on the other side. In a few words, Chris Hayes did what very few have done effectively in articulating the destructiveness of this president and what this president has actually done to the American population. I want you to listen to this and then we'll take it on the other side. Right now, right this moment, there are Americans who are alive and who are healthy who will be dead by the fall. And there are Americans who already died who did not have to all because of the failures of our government and more specifically, the president of the United States. There is no other conclusion you can reach at this point. We've lost every last charitable explanation of the failures, that the disease itself is challenging, which it is, that it's hard to fight, which it is, that it's torn through all different kinds of countries with all different kinds of cultures and governments and institutions. At this point, there's nothing left to say but that Donald Trump has gotten Americans killed and is going to get even more Americans killed in unfathomable numbers. When the pandemic started, I warned on this show, as did everyone we talked to, that the president could not just wish the virus away as much as he wanted to or tried to. Now, the virus that we're talking about having to do, you know, a lot of people think that goes away in April with the heat. Because of all we've done, the risk to the American people remains very low. When you have 15 people, and the 15 within a couple of days is gonna be down to close to zero, it's going to disappear. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear. You yeah. have to be calm. It'll go away. That was inexcusable, egregious, impossibly stupid, and it led to the horrible response we have had to this virus. We didn't test enough. We didn't prepare. But to do it again, almost word for word, action for action, 130,000 deaths later, well, that's horrific. I think we're going to be very good with the coronavirus. I think that at some point uh, that's going to sort of just disappear, I hope. You still believe so? Disappear? Well, I do, I do. Yeah, sure, at some point. And I think we're going to have a vaccine very soon, too. That was today. That was July 1st, 2020. When I saw it reported, I was absolutely positive it was an old clip. As I said before, the president does not learn, and his incompetence and his negligence is getting Americans killed, which is why every day that goes by without his resignation, Americans' health, safety, and lives are increasingly threatened. There's no doubt about it. And uh, if, if more people actually looked at the situation the way it is, in other words, look at the actions of the president and extrapolate that, to the amount of people dying, over 130,000 Americans right now, and extrapolate that we expect likely another 30,000 or so in the next few weeks, and tie it directly to the president's policies or the lack thereof, 
and also promoting this bravado, no mask, even though he, he sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, having functions, having rallies where people get sick. Come on, Herman Cain is now infected with the virus because he went to Tulsa. So if we start laying the brick down, brick for brick, we can actually get to some of those people that still think there's something about this guy that is doing nothing but committing voluntary manslaughter. Now, what I love with what uh, Chris Hayes did is Chris Hayes used those words that, you know, we talk about here all of the times, being graphic. You know, I have accused the Texas Republican Party of uh, manslaughter, of not involuntary manslaughter, but voluntary manslaughter because they knew they, that even with, even though they were getting three years of the Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care Act free of charge, they decided to allow Texans to die. And red states did that, red state after red state. They allowed their citizens to die. If they knew that not giving their citizens something that cost them nothing for the first three years and 10% thereafter, and they did not provide that for their citizens, that is voluntary manslaughter and absent them being, uh, being immune from prosecution from the people, they would easily be prosecuted again for voluntary manslaughter. And what Chris Hayes does there is he presents it immediately as it is. At the end of this year, a lot of people that are good and healthy right now will be dead. And they will be dead because directly resulting from Donald Trump's and his sycophants policies. And we have to get that out there. He is, is responsible for those policies. And then we have to uplift those politicians that are doing a good job and that are calling out this man for the evil that he's throwing upon the American citizenry. And one of those is one of the, one of the young women right here in Harris County that I will continue to, uh, to, to promote as one of the best politicians out there, young up and coming, and not only young and up and coming, but is, is making a difference in this community. And at the same time, now pointing out, pointing out how the good old boys of Texas, the good old boys that run Texas, are a failure to the citizens in this country, to the citizens of, of Texas. So it is important, folks, to listen to this. And it's also important, my brothers and sisters, share this, share this, share this. After I present with Lena Hidalgo, we're going to go with Crenshaw, who is the representative out of District 2 here in Texas, and we're going to show a letter that he's sending out, and I'm sure it's going out to, to, um, to all red state congressmen expecting the Affordable Care Act to be maybe deemed unconstitutional. I don't think Roberts is going to let it, but they're preparing a narrative for that, and I want you to, we're going to go over that a little bit together, but first let's listen to Lina Hidalgo. Houston is in Harris County, and joining us now is the head of its governing body, County Judge Lina Hidalgo. What about the possibility of an overflow plan using NRG Stadium or other large venues to deal with an overflow of cases? I'm praying you don't have to do that, but how much have you contemplated it? From the beginning of this crisis, we've really pulled out all the stops to do everything we can do to protect our community. And one of those strategies is having this medical shelter that we've set up at uh, our stadium complex. Now, that medical shelter will come into play once hospitals are converting normal general population beds into ICU beds because the, the medical shelter is operational and general population beds. Now, the concern is it doesn't do us any good to get there. The contingency plan is there. We always plan for the worst. But this strategy that we need to push our capacity as far as it'll go is not smart from a public health standpoint. It's not right from a human standpoint. And it's also sort of inconsistent from an economic standpoint. If what we're doing is 
pushing everything to the very brink. Our economy is always going to be unstable. We're always going to be chasing this virus. We'll never be in a position where we're proactive, where we are learning from other communities, where we are reopening successfully. And that's the bigger problem I have with this. It's just, it's not a good strategy. Well, let me ask you about that proactiveness. I mean, there's evidence in Texas specifically that as more people were allowed to have indoor businesses and get back indoors, the hospitalizations rose. I wonder how you're looking at the best path forward for Houston. Is it trying to shut some of those businesses down? Is it trying to encourage personal responsibility, personal social distancing, wearing more masks? Is it thinking about big venues like NRG Stadium, Lakewood Church, Joel Osteen's church. The University of Houston has huge, big, spread out buildings. It's got a hotel college, a hospitality college with a Hilton Hotel. Where do you think the biggest difference can be made if things get worse? We had a stay home order initially in March. I issued that order early on. The community was doing great. We flattened that hospitalization curve, but before the curve had a chance to come down on the other side, the state reopened and it took away my power to issue those kinds of, of stay home orders. Where we are right now is sure we can play games, we can have experiments, but if you look at the rest of the country, the one thing we know works that is going to flatten that curve and bring it down is a stay home order. And so that's why I've been asking the governor for the authority to issue one for the community. I have put our community on red alert, asking them to stay home, which I, I hope and I believe folks are listening. But of course, it's not as effective as if there was an order. That's just human nature. And yes, you know, there's this temptation to say, well, now masks are required. You know, now the state has done that and, and perhaps we could cancel this thing and that thing, right. number one, today in Harris County in Texas, restaurants are still open. You can have any gathering of any size as long as it's indoors. You heard that correctly. Indoors is good to go here, even though we know that indoors is actually more problematic. And and we're just hoping for the best. We're hoping that somehow these halfway measures are going to do better, to perform better than the initial stay home order we had. That is just not appropriate for the level of crisis we have here. And it's not a good long-term plan. Even if somehow the curve flattens, you're not gonna bring it down. And until we do that, we won't have the time to really sharpen our tools on tracing, on testing, the new tests that you were mentioning, making sure that we learn from from other communities, how, how slowly to reopen, what to reopen. That's how you think about the long game. That's how you are strategic, both, both from a public health standpoint and from an economic standpoint. Before I let you go, I interviewed you last year, had the pleasure of interviewing you last year in my previous gig. You are the first Latina who was elected Harris County judge, which is kind of the top countywide official in Harris County. Briefly, before I got to let you go, how are Latinx Houstonians? dealing with this crisis? It's, it's, it's tough. You know, on the one hand, we're seeing a lot of people afraid to get tested. Even though our public test sites are open, there's that fear, I think, from the rhetoric coming from so many levels of government that people think that they're going to somehow face a citizenship issue if they make use of the test sites. We are seeing a disproportionate number of Hispanics tested positive. In terms of hospitalization, it's disproportionately high for African Americans. So one thing we do know is this is disproportionately impacting our communities of color. Many of this goes back to long-standing issues of access to care uh, and, and, and all of those other, other broader structural issues that, of course, we've been addressing outside of this crisis. But look, we are only as strong as our weakest link, and the entire community needs to move together on this. Lena Hidalgo is the county judge in Harris County, Texas. Judge Hidalgo, we really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now, let me tell you guys something. Lena Hidalgo has been all over the place in the last three days. On this week, she's been on MSNBC several times, and she's in the Washington Post. And one of the reasons that I'm putting her on here on our program is that if you take a look at the, the narrative, if, if you take a look at how much time she has on MSNBC to lay out the entire case, she laid out an entire indictment on the entire good old boy system in Texas right there. And she did it without being offensive. I would have been a hell of a lot more offensive in saying, 
and our governor is killing Texans. Our governor is responsible for killing a lot of Houstonians right now. Our governor, Greg Abbott, should be in jail for in for voluntary voluntary manslaughter. I would be saying that right now. But she's so diplomatic. But with her diplomat with her diplomacy, she is slicing the the, the governor with a million different cuts. And that gets metastasized into people's minds. Unfortunately, if you take a look at the amount of time when she's on TV here in Houston on the local channels, she does not get enough time to actually frame the message. Well, MSNBC gives her the time to frame the message, the entire, uh, the entire Washington Post article as well, and on here on Politics Done Right, I went ahead and gave what she gave to MSNBC for one specific reason. We have to get the full narrative out, and having her as a, th that perfect spokesperson, young woman, young millennial, that is doing a hell of a job, much better than the good old boys who are paid to screw you. Okay, They are paid to screw you. They want that economy open so that those people that are living in their gated communities, those people that are flying in their private jets, those people that are in their private helicopters that don't have to confront anybody that may have a slight infection, they don't really care. You get sick, you are disposable. Remember that. You are disposable. And when you have Glenn Beck saying, oh, the older people are willing to die to keep our economy strong. That's bull. He's right there taking care of himself. When you hear Dan Patrick, the lieutenant governor of Texas, saying, oh, we need to save the economy at all costs, and I am willing to die, but they're the first ones that are staying away. When Donald Trump is saying, open up the economy, open up the economy, but nobody who gets sick better get close to him, and when somebody gets close to him that gets COVID-19, he goes into a tizzy fit, but he doesn't want spacing, social spacing. He does not want spacing in Tulsa. He does not want spacing in, at the mountains. He does not want spacing in Washington, D.C. for the people that are coming to watch him, neither at Rush, Rushmore, neither at anywhere. These people are in for it for themselves, and if, if the Trump supporters who are going to his rallies, who are going to them playing... The whole reason that they taught these, they taught their sycophants not to use masks is because they wanted to have a reason for them to come to their rallies and look like all is normal and those left-wingers are crazy and we hide the dead people. And what do I mean by we hide the dead people? Let me tell you what I mean by we hide the dead people. This is what it's all about. And I'm going to put this up here. Trump and Biden campaign shift focus to coronavirus as pandemic surges. But I want to read you a section here that says, uh, let's see, if it, this is it. Trump campaign officials and advisors recognize that the administration coronavirus response presents one of the biggest political challenges in the coming months. As voters, this is from New York, the Washington Post. As voters generally disapprove of Trump's handling of the virus and the and push to reopen while still giving Trump higher marks than the Biden and the economy. Faced with some Trump's tide of problematic comments, such as suggesting lungs could be clean with the administration, also plans to rely on surrogates to speak on the issue. And what will they be saying? They will be saying the following, and I, I, I probably have it in, in my other article here. Let me get to that article. This is what it says here. Uh, Trump advisors, by contrast, are seeking ways to reframe his response on the coronavirus, even as the president himself largely seeks to avoid the topic because he views it as a political loser. They are sending official health officials to swing states, putting doctors on TV in regional markets where the virus is surging, crafting messages on an economic recovery, and writing talking points for allies to deliver to potential voters. The goal is to convince Americans that they can live with the virus, that schools should reopen, professional sports should return, a vaccine is likely to arrive by the end of the year, and the economy will continue to improve. White House officials also hope Americans will listen to this, Americans will grow numb. Americans will grow numb to the escalating death toll and learn to accept 
tens of thousands of new cases a day, according to three people familiar with the White House's thinking, who requested anonymity to reveal internal deliberations. Americans will live with the virus being a threat, in the words of one of those people, a senior administration official said. In other words, we don't care a damn about you. A lot of people going to get sick, 1% of you going to die, 20% of you going to get real sick where your lungs are going to be permanently damaged for the rest of your life, or you're going to have a stroke, or you're going to have heart problems, or your kidney is going to be damaged. But we don't care. We don't care. We want you coming to our rallies. We want you going back to work. We don't want to pause this economy for nothing. Because we must win, and we must keep the people, the plutocracy, fed with their dollars. Today I was listening to NPR. Do you realize Jeff Bezos just got divorced? He had $100 billion. He had to give half of it to his wife. So he was left with $50 billion. Since the pandemic, he's worth $100 billion again, and his wife is worth another $100 billion. This is what's happening as Americans are suffering. And the supporters of these guys are El Senor Trump and his allies. And what are we doing? It is imperative that we tell that message, people. It is imperative that we tell that message. Now, Donald Trump also wants to make more money for his people. He wants to make more money for those insurance companies. And how is he going to do that? He is begging to make sure that the Texas, that Texas, who has asked the Supreme Court to get rid of the Affordable Care Act because, hey, the Congress destroyed one of the funding mechanisms for it. No more, no more, uh, in the, no more mandates. There's no more mandates. And if there are no more mandates, then that bill must fall because that, that we're, as Roberts previously said, the mandate was a tax. And as the mandate being a tax, the bill stood. Now there ain't no mandate. So the b bill can't stand if there's not a mandate for those people who are not participating in the Affordable Care Act. The bill can't stand. So that whole thing should tear the bill down. I have a feeling. I have a feeling that... Roberts is going to side with the liberals and keep the keep ACA available. But there is a chance because he has been so he has been so he has been voting with the left for quite a few things. He may be doing that left voting so that it gives him a little bit of cover to destroy the Affordable Care Act and throw everything into chaos. And if he throws all of that into chaos, what do you think happens then? All those people who are on the, on the Affordable Care Act and have high blood pressure, a little bit of protein spillage in from their kidneys, a little uh, back problems in the past, all those things become pre-existing conditions. And at that point, they have the right to Zoom your health care bill. At that point, they even have the chance to not take care of you. At that point, they have the chance to bring all the things that were back before. Remember that fancy word called rescission. Rescission says, by the way, when you signed this contract with us for healthcare, you didn't tell us that you had a, an ingrown toenail. And because you have an ingrown toenail, that's a pre-existing condition, and we would not have written the insurance for you, and therefore your insurance is void. Bye-bye. Ta-ta. We ain't paying. And then, of course, there's a coronavirus. Then, of course, there's a coronavirus. And what does the coronavirus tell you? The coronavirus tells you, oh, my God, we are going to be several. Uh, uh, there's a bill. I saw it on, on, on New York Times. There's one young man, I, I think, at one of the hospitals in New York. He got a bill, $1.029 million for his stay in the emergency room and the, the uh what is it? The NICU? Come on. ICQ, I, ICU room. I mean, just think about this, folks. And they want to get rid of the insurance because, again, so what if a few people die? So what if we bankrupt 10, 15, 20% of Americans? Who cares? As long as the guardians of the gates are okay. As long as those people who work for corporate America are okay and those are the ones that we give visibility to. We don't go into Appalachia to see all them people that are living in trailer parks and that Donald Trump has fooled into believing that he's on their side. 
We don't see those people deep down in the ghettos coming out and getting their view. We don't see those people deep down in the barrios who are suffering day in and day out. We don't see them. They're not on TV. When you watch uh, the morning news, everybody's talking about working from home and how difficult it is and having the kids next to you. Oh, as I'm on my computer doing my work for my job and that kid is right there next to me. They forget. What about all those kids in the Bronx who have to run downstairs and go to school and there ain't no school anymore? What about those kids in Appalachia who live in a trailer park whose only meal is going to come from going to school? What about their learning? They don't have internet in those mountains, right? They live in a trailer. They can't afford the, the, the internet. There's nobody running cables through those big mountains and tunnels to get to them. My daughter was out there and she said, Dad, I didn't know people live like this. And by the way, they didn't look like me or my daughter. But you don't see them on TV because they want the fallacy out there to most Americans. To the majority of Americans, they want you to think, that can't be you, but it's soon becoming you. As all these things occur in America, as we lose the Affordable Care Act, do you think minorities are going to be that much more affected than they are right now? What are the jobs that they are doing right now? The reason they're getting sicker than anybody else right now is because they're in jobs working at McDonald's, serving people, and they're in service jobs, most of them without insurance as it is already. So who do you think not having the ACA is going to affect the most. The people that already still don't have insurance? The people that even if they have it, have lousy insurance? No. It's all the 40 million people that are losing their jobs, some of them good jobs, that will not be able to afford COBRA, and they are going to be left holding the bag. No insurance. And even if they had, they couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford it. If the ACA goes, you can't afford insurance. And insurance companies don't mind because they will find an affordable action. They will find affordable insurance for those people who don't need it. That's who they're willing to insure, those people that don't need it. And when they insure people that don't need it, then what? And that person gets sick, they'll say, Okay, let's see if we can find a technicality not to pay. Let me go to another slide here. Because today, Crenshaw, this is a template that I can guarantee you. And folks who are listening from other states, your GOP is going to send you a letter in the email. They are preparing in case the ACA is undermined by the Supreme Court. And they are saying, they're putting out a message saying, protecting access to affordable health care. I am almost sure this is a form letter that every Republican congressman around the country is sending out. And how are they going to protect it? Here's what they say. Health care remains one of the top concerns I hear. This is, a, this is my congressman telling me this. Health care uh, remains one of the top, and I'm, I have it on the screen, one of the top concerns I hear about from constituents. I wanted to share with you many of the common sense solutions I worked on that lower health care costs and protect those with pre-existing conditions. I'm committed to finding solutions to address these critical health care issues, protecting those with pre-existing conditions. Let's be clear. I believe in protecting those with pre-existing conditions. That's why I am co-sponsor of Pre-Existing Conditions Protection Act 2019, H.R. 6 Nine two. This bill would prohibit the application of pre-existing condition exclusions and guarantee availability of health insurance coverage in the individual and group market if the ACA were repealed. Bull. Look, it cannot be done. It cannot be done. Okay? The reason we had a mandate is to force people all into the pool to get insurance. You cannot get blood out of a rock. The money has to be in there. And you got to get the money from somewhere. And if they are getting rid of all these taxes for businesses, all these taxes that pay for the Affordable Care Act, private insurance can only get the money from one place. From you. And the same thing that, I mean, these guys are, these guys are making the bet that you are stupid. And we have to make the bet that you are not. Next thing he says, lowering health care costs. I'm pleased to co-sponsor 
uh, HR 19, which includes measure to lower drug costs by holding pharmaceutical companies accountable while also protecting medical innovation. Notice that magic that he says, protecting medical innovation. Take care of it, Michael Rudnin. What he means by protecting medical innovation is continuing to allow them to suck it to you. Because medical innovation is a fallacy. Medical innovation says the reason these guys are charging so much for these medicines is because they need to reinvest it into research and development. That is bull. Most of the research and development or a large percentage of the research and development is paid for by whom? You. Your money goes to the universities who develop these programs and these products and then license it and sell it to the private sector who then give them some short stipend for that university and then they suck it right back to you. Don't ever believe the crap that the reason drug prices are high is so that they can reinvest in research and development. Most of their money go into dining and fine dining to the people who are selling these drugs into the bonuses for the insurance com- I mean for the um, for the bonuses for the pharmaceutical companies and the high salaries that the presidents and all these guys get. Don't you ever ever forget that and believe this crap that they're telling you that. You believe that at your own peril. No other country believes it. And every other country forced those thieves, the pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies, for those who allow private insurance companies to abide by rules that they must follow. Don't ever think otherwise. Let's not go there. Uh, now, repealing costly health care insurance. Here's what he said now. The ACA imposed several taxes that increase costs for health care consumers. That makes no sense. It makes no sense. The taxes were increased on, on businesses and other areas so that we could give insurance to people who couldn't afford it. The double speak is that somehow that is for, that by giving back the taxes to these businesses, it's going to be cheaper for you. It makes no sense. Again, they're lying to you. And it's what they do, and it's what they do best. Look, we cannot continue to buy into this. The reason that they get away with this is that nobody, not even, not even the regular news, counteract that. They get who's talking about this mailer that that they're sending out. Which ra- which radio station, which TV station is right now telling all of America that, hey, guess what, Dan? Guess what? Uh, uh, what is his name, my, my congressman? Guess what uh, Crenshaw sent out? And I guarantee you, go to your, go to your mailbox, go to your email. All of you are going to receive this from your congressperson because they're getting ready for in case, in case it gets turned over. And even if it doesn't get overturned, they're still going to use this document to say, this is what we would have done. This is what we would have done. So folks, we cannot buy into the lies. We cannot continue to be guinea pigs for them. I need to have a annou- real quick announcement here, and that is um, there's a town, uh, Freedom Ain't Free Town Hall that's going to be here in Houston. I have it on the screen right now. Check that out. I also have the link to it that I'm going to put into the feed. Uh, one of our, our, our good brothers asked me to go ahead and make sure uh, to put that out. So um, that, that link is on the screen. Anyhow, uh, one of the, the other subject that we wanted to talk about today has to do with employer-based insurance. And I, I think the New York Times uh, got it on the money. Employer-based health care meet massive unemployment. And what that means is that it is clear what the coronavirus has shown is the only answer we have. And when when Biden becomes president, it is incumbent on us to continue to do our job and push them. I don't care if they call it Medicare for all. Just make sure they call it, you know, make sure it is that everybody, irrespective, has health care. Has health care. That is what we have to be sure of. And the, 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 the idea that you, and I know it has some history. Uh, employers didn't want to give money to their employees, so the, the, the unions negotiated, okay, well, you give us health care, all of that. That is fine. But we have, we are, we've gone beyond that. 
Healthcare is ridiculous. Corporations have actually used every American citizen as a cost center. As a cost center to maximize money out of and how much can they get out of you? Whatever your total income is plus whatever credit you can get for plus whatever taxes they can get to the government to cover you. That is the maximization of the money. And all of these corporations want to maximize how much money they can take out of you. Even the bankers do, right? It's called reverse mortgage, right? It's like, hmm, they got a house. How can we make some money on that? Ah, reverse mortgage. I hope I never have to take out a reverse mortgage because I hope there are better alternatives. But what do they do? They always find a manner, a way, they always try to find a way to take it all back. So no matter how much money you've accumulated, by your end of life, either the hospital take it, the insurance companies take it, the bankers take it, but generally speaking, by the time you're done with your life in these days, in the past, in the 60s, in the 70s, when progressives were at their high points, when progressives were making sure laws were passed to protect you, you were able to build assets. You were able to build. Even in a capitalist society that was under strict control, you were able, the individual, to build, to build, to grow. Now, nobody but the top few percentages, a 10% or 20% or so, can actually build a nest egg and grow. But otherwise, they take it all back. Even if you buy your house and it's paid for, eventually, some for, for quite a few people, eventually it is all gone. And why is it all gone? Because that's how the system was designed. It was designed to eat, 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 cannibalize, get maximized. The capitalism is the, the uh, what, what do they call cap? They, they call that the uh, efficient use of resources, the most efficient use of resources. And the most efficient use of resources is to take everything you've got to maximize the profits for the shareholders of the corporations and the bonuses thereof for those who run the corporations. That's what it's all about. You are just a cog. We can change that. I am not saying this to be negative. We have the opportunity, especially with coronavirus. We have that opportunity now to stop that. We have the opportunity to, to drag healthcare away from the, the uh, employers. And you know what? Deep down inside, employers are going to love that they can get rid of departments. They can get rid of all their, their, their most of their human resource department relegated to healthcare, gone. Right? And those people would be gone to work for in other industries. And you know what? We can start talking about reducing the work week because our efficiencies, instead of our efficiencies going to the shareholders, you know, as we get more efficient, profits increase. And guess where all those profits go? To the shareholders. So that's why you see, even as we are in a pandemic, stocks are going up. Of course, it's going to crash. Don't get me wrong now. But stocks are going up because when they do the current, the, the metrics of today, the metrics of today say, I lay people off to make ourselves more efficient. If we are more efficient, when the economy comes back, hey, man, we are a lean, mean driving machine. We don't have all those employees. We don't have all those health care bills. We don't have any of that. So coronavirus gives us a chance to unload people, unload contracts, unload all those things. So our stock market goes up. Every American should be looking at the stock market. And every time Donald Trump talks about how, to show you how he's disassociated from reality, people are hurting all over the country. And he goes and said, hey, things are great. The stock market is going up and I'm going to give you jobs, 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 jobs. People are hurting. People are still in food lines. That should, every, every progressive, as they campaign, should be pointing all of that out. They should have pictures of people in lines. They should have all those 40 million people that are unemployed shown. This is what you're calling a strong economy. These are the wasted. These are the ones that don't matter. These are the ones that you don't care for. We have to be able to tell the story, and we have to be able to tell the story appropriately. We really need to be able to do so. All right, I only have about, oh, wow. I, I kind of got, got there. Hey, guys, I'm going to answer 
these later, but let me just welcome everybody. Michael Rudnan, welcome aboard. AVQ, Evan Q, welcome aboard. Uh, let's see, Norman Reynolds, welcome aboard. Sandra Walsh, welcome aboard. Uh, Rose Williams, how are you, Rose? Uh, let's see, uh, who else is here? Dimitri OG, welcome aboard. Uh, I've seen somebody else in the chat, in the chat, in the chat. Let's see. If I miss you, please just drop me a line. Patricia De Galani. Yes, I love Lina Hidalgo as well. And one of the things that I think all of us have to do with Lina, because, you know, she's going to be getting it from the left and the right. We have to be there to uplift her. Uh, Bruce Pollard, welcome aboard, my brother. Uh, Melissa E. Noble, welcome aboard. Troy Astro, welcome aboard. Uh, Lawrence Sims, welcome aboard. Uh, para ver, para ver, para ver uh, who else is here. Mary Dior, welcome aboard. I hope, I hope I said that right. Forgive me if I said it wrong. Deborah and Borgen, welcome aboard. You're here as well. Folks, anybody else is here, just drop me a line, but I've got to get to my little plug here. And you know what my plug is. Folks, please do remember that this is a program that needs your support. By the way, we are now, guess what? We are now on, uh, we can actually take subscriptions on Facebook now. I mean, uh, I, I, I've, I've been waiting for them to just go ahead and say that for the longest time. Uh, we could only take subscriptions on, uh, on, uh, on Patreon. I, I still prefer the Patreon subscriptions, but we are also now on Facebook, which a lot of people find it a lot easier to do Facebook because that is where they are. You know, they're on Facebook all of the time. So what I'm going to do first is if you want to provide support for us, you can become, a, we just opened it. So I think we only have like two members right now. And I'd love to get that up to 100 members quickly as well. But anyway, that is our uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook, to become a member on Facebook. That is the link right there that I just placed in the, in the chat to become a member on, a, a subscriber, I should say subscriber, to become a subscriber on Patreon. I just added that to the field to become a, uh, you can become a subscriber as well via PayPal. I also are a donor via PayPal. I just added that link. And of course, please feel free to visit our store. Our store has a whole lot of good stuff. What does our, what, uh, we have this folks. As I see it, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom, and my book, Lose Weight and Be Fit Now. All of this goes towards supporting the show, making sure that I can continue to do this. This is a, this is a love of 16 hours a day, but you know what? We are going to let it happen. After You know, this is going to have to go way beyond the election because we have a lot of work to do after we've won. A lot of work to do after we've won. It's just beginning after we've won. You can also get our cup, the Politics Done Right cup at store.politicsdoneright.com. Or actually, I have it at politicsdoneright.com slash store. I change all those links to make it easier to remember. So please, folks, I need subscribers on Facebook. So if you, if you have the wherewithal, it's inexpensive. It's like saying, Egberto, I like what you're doing. I'm going to get you a cup of coffee. So please do it for me at uh, facebook.com. Uh, I, I, the link that I have there, uh, politicsunright.com slash Facebook. As well, we have the store. As well, we have Patreon. Those links are in there or on the top of this. Look, folks, I know you have many places where you can actually watch these shows or learn this. That you're with me. It's my honor to have you here. Please do remember, we are here to serve. We are here to support. And um, we will continue doing this the best we can. You know what we must do. You know what we will do. You know what we've got to do. My name is Egberto Willies. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this baby. I am what? Out! I'm Egberto Willies, host of Politics Done Right, an independent news program. I post several news videos of interest every day. I ask you so kindly to subscribe to my channel and please leave me some comments. Thank you very much.